everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jim Anaya, and I'm the dean of the University of Colorado Law School. Uh, welcome to you all, um, and welcome to all the homecoming goers uh, back to Boulder, uh, or back to the law school if you live in Boulder or been around Boulder. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this lecture. And uh, we were very fortunate to have this lecture series sponsored by John and Kathy Rosenblum, uh, who are here, thanks to them. Uh, John and Kathy have been gracious enough to establish an endowment that uh, provides for this lecture associated with homecoming uh, every year. And it allows us to, to bring or feature uh, first-rate speakers uh, to the, those who come to be with us for homecoming and, and uh, also to benefit our educational community here uh, more generally. Um, and speaking for, about first-rate speakers, uh, our speaker today is the distinguished professor uh, Charles Wilkinson who actually does hold the, the title of Distinguished Professor, which is a title given on to, to very few here at the University of Colorado. And he also holds the title of Moses Lasky, a Professor of Law. Um, Charles is, of course, you know, well known to all of those associated with the University of Colorado Law School or have had anything uh, to do with it or have known anything about the University of Colorado. Uh, he is uh, a, a, not only a well-known figure here, but nationally for his work in federal Indian law and public lands. Uh, you might say that in many ways he helped write the book on federal Indian law along with the late get, get, uh, David Getchis and others who helped found the, the subject of Indian law as a distinct subject of study. And we're very proud to have had uh, both Charles and the late David Getchis uh, uh, do that uh, important work here at the University of Colorado. Uh, Charles is not only uh, a great scholar and teacher, he has also been involved and done a number of very important projects, one of which we'll, you'll hear about uh, from him today. Uh, but this isn't the first such important project he's done involving uh, Indian peoples or uh, and native peoples in this country, uh, federal lands, issues of natural resources. Uh, and he's counseled tribes as well as federal agencies uh, in in, in negotiating uh, important settlements and in achieving important uh, arrangements that uh, in one way or another I believe we can say benefit us all. And I'm, I'm very pleased that he is here to speak with us about uh, one of his, or perhaps his latest such important project, the project involving the Bears Ears National Monument. Uh, the story of the Bears Ears Monument is one with a beginning, a middle, but still no end. Uh, and we're going to hear about where that story is today and what the possible possibilities are for uh, that end, or perhaps not the end, but the future of that, that story and the monument itself. So it's, it's my great, great pleasure and it's with great pride that uh, I introduce you know, my friend and colleague, uh, Charles Wilkinson. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Jim, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Um, uh, it's great to meet people like uh, John and uh, Kathy Rosenblum. And they are public spirited and they love this university. And um, I, I was very taken uh, in talking with them uh, about a subject they addressed very carefully, but very precisely, and saying that they had reached the point, uh, John is in, uh, was, in the, uh, was a member of the class of 74 here, that they were uh, completely mobile and could settle wherever they wanted to, 
and that uh, they ended up saying, no, we'll just stay right here. And a big part of that to them was uh, the University of Colorado. And they are senior auditors who take advantage of uh, being able to go to courses and enjoy the campus uh, generally. And I, I think that's uh, uh, really kind of inspiring to remember because a university does do that to, to people, to the community and, and make them uh, think. Um, also, uh, we have royalty here uh, uh, this afternoon. And uh, John Echohawk, if you could just wave, put your hand up. <laughs> to the rest of you, uh, many of you are back for um, homecoming. It's, it's a festive week, kind of a time to celebrate. And uh, it just occurred to me in particular, uh, for those of you who uh, uh, schooled in Fleming. Um, I hope that you've been able to adopt this new building as, as your own, and uh, because it, uh, it is. Um, I, I would like to address uh, the uh, Bears Ears National Monument uh, situation. Um, the Antiquities Act of 1906 uh, allows presidents uh, nearly complete authority to uh, proclaim national monuments. Uh, a monument in this sense is the rough equivalent of a national park. And the presidents, as I'll come back to later, uh, have had great discretion in doing this. It's an act that Congress sent out to uh, presidents and it's, it's very broadly written and, and is an interesting statute. Um, uh, as anything that Teddy Roosevelt touched is. And so we have this particular uh, monument proclaimed on December 28th, 2006. It's the uh, uh, Second, okay. it's the uh, second largest monument in the lower 48 states. And um, this, of course, is a, is a map of it. And, uh, wow, uh, Southwesterners that we all are. Uh, here's Moab, and this is a distance of about 60 miles north and south, and this monument is about 2% of the state of Utah. Uh, it is a federal public land monument, and um, there are some uh, considerable number of state inholdings in it, about 100,000 acres, uh, a little over 10%, and um, I think in time, uh, those acres will be transferred uh, to the United States in a land exchange. So it will usually, as, as has happened with most monuments, will be completely federal in time. Uh, the tribes um, here who uh, formed the Bears Ears Tribal Coalition to establish this monument are the uh, Navajo, Hopi, uh, Northern Ute, Southern Ute, and Zuni. And this map is the region to the native eye, meaning that it's um, uh, without state lines. And that came about because of the frustration of the tribes that Utah officials took the position that they couldn't testify at public hearings because they weren't residents. And so, so uh, there are uh, some uh, tribal members, some Navajos and some, some Ute Mountain Utes do live uh, uh, in Utah and have some lands in Utah, but um, the Hopi and Zuni and Northern Ute don't. 
but, uh, uh, but they all used it traditionally. And so uh, they, they wanted to find a way to articulate how it seems to them. And uh, they came up with this um, map. Um, as Jim mentioned, and as you know, the monument is, is uh, being uh, contested now by, or will be shortly, by President Trump. And I want to finish with that and um, basically promise to you, I hope I keep this exactly, that uh, we'll leave uh, half an hour for questions at the end. I'd, I'd really be interested in that, and I urge you to uh, uh, participate. Um, this is glory country. These are the bear's ears. Um, it's uh, a formation that is the largest in the area. It's about 10,000 feet. Uh, so it is not uh, uh, a high mountain range for the west, but it can be seen in every direction. And uh, particularly from the south, it goes out to about 60, probably 80 miles of visibility on a, on a, on a good day. And this, uh, which is on the cover also, is the Bears Ears um, with uh, Navajo Mountain in the background. And uh, photographer really got lucky, huh, on, uh, on that one. Um, and so you have uh, these red rock formations that uh, captivate us so um, in this monument. Uh, that is the arch on Owl Creek uh, that one of you has hiked up, at least one of you has hiked up. And uh, so many other uh, photographs, of course, that we could uh, run of just the uh, landscape. <clears throat> it is one of the most important archaeological resources in the world. And in the late 1800s, the Wetherill brothers, ranchers, uh, not bad people, uh, uh, certainly at the beginning, uh, came across these amazing villages that have been there a thousand, two thousand years. And they came back after some of their early explorations and found these baskets and pots and sandals and jackets uh, and mortars and pestles and started taking them out and finding very quickly that there was a hell of a lot of interest around the world in these artifacts. And they became semi-rich, but uh, the big interest moved in uh, eventually with tractors and uh, became even richer. And uh, then, uh, at the exact moment isn't known, but uh, people started grave robbing incredibly enough, to uh, sell the bones. And um, so that's Monarch uh, Village. Oh, in May, uh, my wife Ann and I got to take our nephews and nieces and a few of our sons down there. and. Hiked in. It's uh, like a lot of places. It, it is. It, it's in Comb Ridge that you you may know, uh, but uh, you know, this is probably just a 45 minute, maybe a uh, an hour hike in. Not a long one, and the uh, tiny hands phenomenon that uh, various archaeologists and anthropologists have offered their suggestions on how that happened, these tiny hands. Uh, this is a, 
petroglyph uh, in which the images are pecked in. Um, uh, and then you have pictographs which are painted. And all the countries full of them. Um, in the mid 1800s, the United States moved the Indian people out. It was one of the main origin points for the uh, infamous long walk of the Navajos. And they were rounded up and uh, uh, sometimes shot, sometimes raped, and forced out of this area, as were other peoples. Um, a great many different tribes had used this area over time. Uh, some lived there for long and short periods of time. Others came through, maybe hunted. Others just came through as a travel route. Um, and so the fact that there are five tribes today who are bringing this forward, there are uh, many Indian peoples who are uh, interested in wanting to protect bear's ears. And so they were moved out, and they were moved to the reservations, where uh, that old phrase of you're off the reservation, well, to an Indian person during the late uh, uh, 1800s, pretty well into the 20th century, uh, you better stay on the reservation or you're going to get arrested or shot. And so it was hard to go back. But they did in increasing numbers, sometimes swimming the, uh, the big San Juan River uh, to get over there. And they would hunt, uh, gather medicines, other vegetation, hold ceremonies, go to the old sacred places and the old places where just the family gathered. And they kept coming back. And the local citizens were not happy about this. Uh, to them, uh, they had settled this land, which means running the tribes off. And uh, they thought of it as their land. And boy, when you look at the Hole in the Rock uh, expedition that came down from Denver, uh, from uh, Salt Lake City area in uh, the late 1860s, you can see how much courage it took to come down to this country. They were coming down because Brigham Young had told them to go settle. And uh, it was, there, there was very little non-Indian settlement there. And over time, they did come to think of it as theirs. And so uh, they were going to hold on to it and continually forced Indian people off. In uh, 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 1968, Robert Kennedy was running for president. And he came to Navajo, one of the first people, uh, politicians, to visit a reservation and uh, came up to this area. And people said, they're looting. They're taking our, 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 grave, our graves, our people who have passed away. Please help us. They're ruining this country, this wonderful country. And he said he would do something. And of course, we lost him soon thereafter. But uh, the idea of doing something uh, remained alive. And in uh, 1910, a group called Utah Dene Bakea, UDB, uh, not a tribal group, but an Indian group, uh, mostly Navajo and Utes, uh, acted as kind of a conservation group, but a, a little broader concept than that. And, um, and they decided that they were going to try to try to figure this out. And they did prodigious research. Um, uh, uh, including uh, cultural mapping, including uh, numerous interviews with elders and others, on-the-site visits, book research. They, they brought in uh, academics to uh, research and trying to define the area that ought to be protected. And they began to think of it as a cultural landscape. And they came up with a map of 1.9 million acres. Uh, today, the reservation is 1.35. The, the uh, uh, 
monument is 1.35 million. Their, their uh, map was 1.9 million acres. And uh, it was, it was uh, uh, carefully justified all the way through as having cultural significance. And to them, that was the area that should be set aside. And so they inquired around. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, Utah delegation was uh, trying to uh, work out a settlement where these wonderful wild lands in Utah that still hadn't been decided upon, they were in, in wilderness study status or, or, or other uh, status, so that they weren't being developed. And uh, the uh, uh, delegation decided that they wanted to uh, have a process where everybody would be at the table and they'd decide, well, the, the, the tribes and, and the conservationists decided pretty soon, although they kept at it in good faith, I, I felt for a, for a long time, that, uh, that it was so tilted toward extractive development, especially mining, that, uh, that it just really wasn't going to work out. And so they went uh, to uh, uh, the White House to talk about a national monument. Didn't get much of an answer, uh, but, uh, but they did. And then, and isn't it true that, that the only president we can imagine who would have this thought, did have this thought, which is that the uh, Antiquities Act, which is to set aside lands for uh, historic and scientific interest, that it ought, there ought to be some monuments to honor uh, dispossessed peoples. And so Cesar Chavez, uh, uh, gay and lesbian sites of foundings of the movement, a few others, Japanese uh, monuments. But he kind of had this eye, his eye on this one. And um, everybody knew, because I want to tell you right now that the Utah delegation and the governor's office just went after this like uh, sharks in a school of tuna. I mean, they, they went to every length to attempt to block it from President Obama taking action. And, um, um, uh, but at one point, and this, this, of course, is apocryphal. This may not have happened, but as far as I could tell, it did happen, was that uh, uh, somebody was briefing Obama, one of his staff members was briefing Obama, Obama on this petition because he hadn't uh, seen, uh, done a monument for Indians in his desire to represent dispossessed peoples. And, oh, the Indian contacts with the land, the relationship to the land certainly warrants it. And, uh, and he did apparently say at the end of the uh, briefing, make sure I have ink in my pen that day. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and he did, as we'll see. So um, the uh, UDB now was uh, working hard, was, was briefing all over the place on, on their, the, the outlines that they had described. All the other tribes agreed that they were the right boundaries. And, but UDB recognized, because you see, and, and many of you know this, the basis of Indian policy is federal tribal relations with tribes as governments, as sovereigns. And so UDB, which was a nonprofit, a very effective organization, but a nonprofit, knew that it wasn't the exactly the best entity to bring this proposal forward that the tribes ought to do it. And so uh, there was a meeting on July 16th, 2015. I, I swear, uh, whether it's a list of six, five, three, or one, I'm not quite sure, but it's on one of those lists of my favorite meetings ever. It was really dynamic. And uh, 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 a fellow named Eric Descheny uh, from Navajo was the chair. And uh, people kept saying, um, uh, you know, we ought to really form an intertribal 
coalition and, and, and get the tribes involved. And, and then people would say, which tribes? And they came up with these tribes. Most people agreed these would be the right tribes, unless others wanted to join in, which it turned out they, they didn't. They were happy with these five tribes bringing it forward. And uh, uh, so Eric said, says, you know, you sound like you want to create a, an intertribal coalition for Bears Ears. Anybody have a motion? Somebody made a motion. Everybody raised their hands, and we had the intertribal coalition founded. And then uh, right away, somebody said, how do you create an intertribal coalition? And Eric said, you just did. <laughs> and this turned out to be, I want to tell you in terms of social movements, and if you ever get a chance to talk to people about it, this was one of the most fascinating organizations I've ever seen. It had no budget. It had no employees, but the, a number of organizations just sent staff people. And, they, and, and I, I signed up. I, 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 on, on July 16th, I said to them that I would do it pro bono and do whatever they wanted me to do, um, sort of asking myself from the other side of my brain whether that was a good idea, but, but I did it. And, and a lot of other people did it. And so. Uh, there, there was a staff, really, of 20 or 25, really effective people, whether uh, scientists, lawyers, uh, advocates, just good advocates, um, uh, people who knew the media, um, with this uh, crazy organization. And all I can tell you is that, that it, it, it was going along so that we were getting op-ed pieces um, in the papers, a few editorials in favor of the, the papers coming down, but we got a lot of op-ed pieces uh, and, and uh, you know, radio and TV shows. And all of a sudden, we started hearing about op-ed pieces that we didn't do, <laughs> that citizens were just coming forward and doing it. And then the recreation industry got involved. And we never asked the rec recreation agency per se to came in, but they dived in. I mean, you know, this is a big development in natural resources policy over the past 20 years is, is the influence of, of the recreation industry. And man, did they ever go into it. Uh, Patagonia, I think, was the most uh, enthusiastic, and, 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 but, but they really all came in. And, uh, um, and so, and, and then during this, the uh, tribes and their representatives, including me, made many, many trips to Washington. And I, I will tell you that the reason we have this monument, I think, um, is the authenticity and dignity of the Indian leaders who were involved. And they... Uh, uh, were able to make presentations, often in a low-key way, that just show these are real people. They really are connected to the land. And 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 uh, uh, one one woman uh, who was a tribal council member at uh, Ute Mountain Ute, um, Regina uh, uh, White Skunk, twice was making presentations once in the state legislature in Utah and once in a subcommittee hearing in uh, Washington with Rob Bishop from Utah, who was pushing this mightily uh, as chair. Twice she was testifying and was told to just go sit down. Interrupted and by, by mail people who were running the meeting. And each time she did it and just went back, and of course the, 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 the press descended on her, and, and each time she said the truth, which was um, my, my parents and grandparents just taught me that even if you're insulted, you just stay dignified. Just be true to yourself. And, and she did and went back. And, 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 and that was an example, just one example of, uh, of that. And so at the meeting of uh, uh, July 20, uh, 16th, they also decided uh, to uh, 
uh, using the boundaries, to file a proclamation with the President of the United States asking for the uh, monument, uh, saying that they wanted to make it the best proclamation that had ever been submitted, and I, from what I can tell, it probably was, uh, and you can you know, get it on uh, uh, Bears Ears, uh, coalition org, and, um, um, and 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 they decided that it had to be submitted by October fifteenth, as opposed to October sixteenth. And because they wanted to be sure that the president, who was leaving office on January 20th, 1917, this year, would have enough time and wouldn't, wouldn't be pressured. And, and the federal people that they met with were really very supportive of that and appreciated it. And so they did get it in. And they um, uh, uh, submitted it to the White House. And um, had a press conference at the National Press Club, and um, this is the group. Um, and uh, on the left is Alfred Lamakwahu from Hopi, um, Eric Descheny, the dynamic young Navajo who's in the Arizona legislature now, who was co-chair. This is the woman I mentioned to you. Uh, uh, from Ute Mountain to Ute, uh, Regina uh, White Skunk, who, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the next uh, fellow over is uh, Octavius Sayatua from Zuni, um, and then Malcolm Lehigh from Ute Mountain Ute and Willie Gray Eyes from Navajo. Now, uh, this was taken the day of the hearing, and um, the hearing was extremely successful. Uh, so much so that when it was over, the Washington Press Corps applauded. <laughs> and, and isn't it true you go to journalism school, I'm sure, and, and the first day uh, there, you, you are, are told that you don't allow anybody to applaud. You don't applaud a, a press conference. It's not allowed. But they did. And, um, and I want to say that uh, the moment that I remembered most was with Malcolm Lehigh, who was in training to be a medicine man. Um, and I've never said this in public before, but he... Uh, gave me a ceremony one time, just uh, uh, he thought I was tense. And, and so he did what, what could be called a back rub, but it, it was, that's not fair to what he did. So, uh, so, so Malcolm, right before, the, and by the way, this is the first time I'd ever gone back to Washington with a group of tribal members where we didn't have rehearsals and where we didn't prep them. It didn't prep them at all. They had 55 minutes, they knew that, and they divided the time up. And Malcolm came up to me and he said, I think I'm going to give my testimony in Ute. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I said, yeah, yeah, you'll kind of, and you would explain where you're from and who your family is and, and so forth, which Indian people often do. And he said, no, I was kind of thinking of doing the whole thing. Uh, and so I said, well, OK, OK, you decide. And I did not think he would do it. He did. He got up and talked for five minutes in Ute. And everybody in the room understood what he said. You could feel it. And, uh, and it was a group, it's, it's an interesting group because two of them, of the males, were Marines. And, uh, and they were dressed differently. Now, you've got uh, uh, two people with ceremonies, ceremonial uh, clothes. And then you've got other, and, and so, and Willie Gray Eyes is very traditional. And so, um, you have a combination of people it was easy to see who all are traditional, and yet all are comfortable in this world today. And that, that's why they're 
presentation, I think, was so successful and why, as I say, this uh, 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 proclamation became law. Uh, the, the year of, of 2016 was, was the year when, of course, things got most intense. And uh, it was interesting in Interior because um, um, I think almost everybody, quote, wanted to do it, but it raised so many questions. The size, uh, the Utah delegation, and uh, 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 one congressman was member was chair of the investigative committee in the house and the other of the natural resources committee and they had to go before the natural resources committee often that's interior reports right through it and they they were very aggressive um, they thought that um, uh, it was the end of a way of life if this would would be passed uh, the people in southern Utah felt that. Um, they kept referring to how the people of San Juan County do not want this. The people of San Juan County do not want this. 57% of San Juan County is native. And in one straw poll, when the county commission ran a, a poll on what they should do, the tribe's um, petition, wh which they had refused to put on the ballot, won going away with 480 votes uh, in a write-in campaign. The, the, the county commission picked a heavily development project that had received one vote. The people of San Juan County. And, um, um, and and so th there were political forces. It was very popular nationally. Utah, the public opinion has been split about equally. Um, um, and it's people would you know when I people would ask me what I'm working on, I say bears ears, and they say, oh, that's the contentious one. Well, it was contentious really because of the Utah delegation in the governor's office. I swear. I mean. Republicans signed off on it, but they, it was just, you know, this is something we should sign off on. There, there weren't people from other states who seemed to uh, uh, be much interested. Um, so there was that going on, but also there was just good professionalism at work, and, and we, the, 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 the tribes, asked for collaborative management, which has never been done before on the federal lands. And um, it would mean joint decision making, and uh, uh, and that was a big thing, and and I, I knew it would be, um, and I, I and I knew it should be, and so people throughout the department uh, really uh, that was a big big matter, and uh, uh, but we settled that, and uh, came up with a formula for collaborative management that is in the final uh, proclamation. Um, most of you are lawyers, and um, uh, I realized about halfway through this that for the creation of national monuments, which is left to the president entirely, no NEPA, no uh, uh, congressional Involvement. It's just the president. The president could wake up in the morning and sign a write a national monument in hand and, and give it to his assistant, and, and, and it's and it's valid. And so there is no process. And the lawyers in the room all groan at how much process we have to go through today. But I'll tell you, being in a situation with no process and having to get the support of the administration 
uh, last time I counted in just the Forest Service and, and, and Department of Interior, you're talking about several thousand people, and of course it's not that many, but believe me, it felt like it. And uh, one, one time a really good friend of mine, a graduate uh, of this law school and uh, a wonderful federal servant, said to me over the phone, not, nicely trying to help me really, he says, you know, I just don't think that fits with our procedures for national monuments. And I said to him, um, I've been looking around for your procedures. Could you send them to me? <laughs> and he, there was a long pause, and he says, I'm getting your drift. <laughs> but it was, it was really frustrating in that regard. It helped a little bit to realize it, and uh, that, 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 that uh, at least you understood the situation. But there, were no, there are no procedures. So, um, the uh, proclamation drafting group gets together and, and the president signs the proclamation on, the, uh, on December 28th. That's a celebration at Bears Ears, and it's, it's very interesting because this is Bears Ears from the north side, right up under Bears Ears, and they don't exactly look like Bears Ears from this one place. If, if you back up a half a mile, they look like Bears Ears, because Bears Ears is a formation where any person looking at it says, hey, those look like Bears Ears. <laughs> and, uh, but this is a celebration in the summer, and in here is Sally Jewell, Secretary of Interior. And just to give you one person's um, reaction, and, and I, I don't know, talking with people in the department, I, I think that, that I had a sense that people agreed with this. She started slowly, second term of Obama's, for two years, and then was a gigantic secretary. And uh, she, she found her, her legs, and uh, uh, on this, she was just magnificent and uh, uh, almost can't say how. Well, this is taken about three hours later. We uh, had a meeting in a, in a teepee with people, their backs against the canvas around, very solemn and just talked and people talked. And she was, she was in tears and the best kind of tears uh, most of the time. And she's been back uh, to the area. Uh, she hadn't been there before, uh, backpacking at least three times. Uh, so she, she ended up, I, I, and I'm, I sort of, um, having started out with Stuart Udall, have watched Secretaries of Interior over the years, been kind of compulsive about trying to understand them and what they did. And, and it turns out she, she's right, right up there uh, to be sure. The proclamation, um, to me, these are some of the best words that have ever been written about Indian people and tribes by the United States of America. There's not an ounce of sentimentality here. There's no romanticism. There, there's no paternalism. There is a factual account of what happened and in, 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 in admiration of qualities that deserve to be admired. First time I believe that uh, the, the native language, native languages had ever been used in, in a monument proclamation. Um, this is one of the densest and most significant landscapes in the United States. And again, Navajo people took that phrase, cultural landscape, and, and, and brought it to life. Um, abundant Rock art, ancient cliff dwellings, ceremonial sites, and countless other artifacts provide an extraordinary archaeological and cultural record that is important to us all. The area's human history is as vibrant and diverse as the ruggedly beautiful landscape. The Moki steps and other things illustrate the early people's ingenuity and per per perseverance because Moki Steps goes up the side of Cedar Mesa 
where the final chase scene in uh, the Monkey Wrench Gang was held. And, and, but they made it and, 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 and it created it. Uh, resources that they name allow visitors to marvel at artistry and architecture that have withstood thousands of seasons in this harsh climate. Native stories of creation, danger, protection, and healing. And some of you know about native stories uh, of the Southwest or elsewhere. And boy, do they, great way to tell, treat, talk, tell, treat, to teach young people histories. OK, uh, Aldo Leopold, John Muir, uh, these words belong there. The traditional ecological knowledge amassed by the Native Americans whose ancestors inhabited this region, passed down from generation to generation, offer critical insight into the historic and scientific significance of the area. Such knowledge is itself a resource to be protected and used in understanding and managing this landscape sustainably for generations to come. Um, now we're, that of course is the intellectual foundation and physical foundation for um, collaborative management. Um, in recognition of the importance of tribal participation in management and to ensure, now that's a shall word, uh, that management decisions affect, affecting the monument reflect tribal expertise and traditional and historical knowledge. The secretary shall meaningfully engage with, the, this is not consultation. The, the, the tribes just said consultation is just a box to be checked by the agencies. Uh, the, the, the secretary shall care, and that's really field people, shall carefully and fully consider integrating the traditional and historical knowledge and expertise into land management. And here is a um, uh, um, a group of, uh, a family group of Zunis. And uh, there's been a lot of ceremonies, and, and this was an evening for a ceremony, and, and, and they danced uh, later as the uh, sun went down. Now, this is the Antiquities Act of 1906, and um, these are, the, this is about half of the act. 1906, why can't we do it now? Uh, and the rest is not really directly relevant to this proposal that apparently now is going to come down next Tuesday in Salt Lake City uh, when President Trump is going to uh, either extinguish or probably uh, 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 greatly uh, reduce the size of Bears Ears. And um, so you've got the phrase, the president may in his discretion. Now, the Antiquities Act has not been litigated much, but the issues that have been litigated mostly have had to do with this phrase, darn it, I'm sorry, this phrase, the, the, the Monument shall be the smallest area compatible with the proper care and management. Smallest area compatible. This act came out of a bill submitted by Edgar Lee Hewitt, an anthropologist who had in it a 640 acre, one section maximum. And some bright eyed and probably wise uh, 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 attorney in, in one of the resource committees changed it from 640 acres, no one knows who it was, uh, uh, to the smallest area compatible. Well, there are two groups of presidents in natural resources, law, and policy. 
The first group is Teddy Roosevelt. The second group is everybody else. <laughs> um, Nixon was pretty good. Uh, he's in a tie for 11th <laughs> with all the others who are coming in uh, below, the, below him. He's, it was Teddy Roosevelt was it. And so Teddy Roosevelt, John Muir, by the way, invited him out to the Grand Canyon. Teddy Roosevelt stood on the south rim, looked down on the Grand Canyon, and say, I hereby proclaim this to be the Grand Canyon National Monument, 800,000 acres. 800,000. And so um, uh, many presidents uh, had large monuments. Uh, Jimmy Carter was one. Um, and uh, Clinton was one with the Grand Staircase Escalante, which is also in Utah. It's now the largest in, in, the, in, in the country, 1.7 million acres. But every single case, the courts, what they really said was, and a couple said it expli explicitly, the president in his discretion, the original statute said in his discretion, they just changed it a couple years ago to, to make it gender neutral. In the president's discretion, that's what this act says. That's how much authority the president has. Now, <clears throat> as you know, this litigation will um, have a whole lot of issues in it. But it really, really comes down to this. I think. I think it's going to basically come down to this. And you then, then you'll have to, the, the, the judges will think that and then clear away a lot of underbrush. That, that, that's what I'm predicting. Because I, I do believe the tribes uh, uh, have the better position on the law. And um, this statute delegates, doesn't it, to the president only one power. And that is the power to proclaim national monuments not to extinguish them, not to modify them. It's never been litigated, but the, an attorney general's opinion in, in uh, 1938 that, that for years, I mean, just w before this all ever happened, I just intone in class that it appears that uh, a president can't extinguish or, or make large changes to uh, national monuments. Um, secondly, and, uh, 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 and this is very powerful, in 1976 with the Federal Land Management Policy Act, FLIPMA, Congress did a full-blown review of the field and um, uh, to take out uh, uh, laws that, that are not needed anymore. But in regard to the Antiquities Act, they uh, passed a statute saying that cha big changes to monuments are for Congress, not the secretary. So the statute begins, the secretary shall not. And the secretary never did have power over monuments. It's the president. And they, the legislative history shows they meant president. But in a statute that was about as well drafted as, as, as they come, it really was. It was a 12-year project, and it was carefully done. But in this case, uh, it says secretary instead of president. We'll just have to see. I mean, the courts would, would have to replace the word, I guess you have to say this, uh, word uh, secretary with president. But that would is what Congress intended. And so um, there have been a few modifications over the years. The most dramatic was uh, when President Wilson uh, took out about half of, of uh, 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 what is now um, Olympic National Park. It was an Olympic National Monument. Um, but that never went to court. And no other time has gone to court. And it, Probably doesn't matter, but uh, in, in 38, uh, Franklin Roosevelt brought 
almost all of that land back into Olympic National Park. But, uh, but there was that one big uh, one. And, and so that side of the tradition will be heavily uh, relied upon, I'm sure, by the people on the other side. But um, um, it does uh, seem, it seems to me anyway, that the 38 opinion suggested that presidents could make minor changes, not, not major ones. Couldn't, couldn't extinguish entirely and could, could only make minor changes. So we'll see, but, but it does seem to me that it's a uh, case uh, you can't ever predict litigation, can you? Uh, again, there are a lot of lawyers in the room, and all of us have made predictions that turned out to be wrong. Uh, so, uh, but uh, th that's uh, what, how it looks to me. It's how it looked to me before this ever came into my mind. Uh, Bears ears. I mean, it, from how many years? I can't count how many of teaching public land law and researching there. Um, so, good. I kept my promise. Uh, and um, um, I, I'd just be most interested in your questions about any part of this process, in, you know, f from time immemorial up to next Tuesday. Yes. Yeah, Congress has that authority. Uh, Senator Bish or Congressman Bishop, who led the charge against Bears Ears and has led the charge against the Antiquities Act for years, has a bill out of committee uh, in the House that would make changes, call for, well, just would make changes and, and weaken the Antiquities Act. And Congress absolutely has power. Congress absolutely has power to extinguish Bears Ears. Uh, under the uh, Constitution, Congress has primary authority over the federal public lands, and, and it, it could do that. Um, the uh, Senate is, is going to be a very different matter th than the House. And it may not go through the House, uh, but, uh, but it, it'll, it'll be difficult in the Senate. But could go through. But, but, it, but, it, but the present bill is not retroactive, so. Right. But here's the thing, it would be a full of filibuster with any other president. No, 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 I'm talking about, I'm talking about the bill getting through the House. Right. Will not get through the Senate. Oh, I see what you're, I see what you're, yes, I, I see what you're saying. Pardon me, pardon me. Uh, I'm going to run a mic to people with questions because I think we're doing this a live stream as well. Um, and so everyone can hear. So, sweet. Hey, Charles, Sean McAllister. Ah. How are resource extraction issues treated by the designation? And, you know, what were the opponents really fighting for um, to try to prevent this? In, in the case of Bears Ears? Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, um, I, I've, it had to do with the worldview of Southern Utah. And um, um, as you know, it's, it's a complicated worldview. Um, it is deeply held. They mean the phrase, it's the end of a way of life. Uh, Secretary uh, Jewell held one of, just one of the best public meetings I've ever been to. It was really good government and came out to Bluff, Utah. 2,000 people came. Um, the previous largest meeting in Bluff, Utah was probably 19. <laughs> uh, you couldn't find a, a lawn to park on. Uh, um, and everybody got two minutes. And Probably, and so almost 100 people spoke, I believe, and probably 15 started out by saying, I'm a seventh generation uh, Utah, or eighth, or, or sixth, or fifth. 
and they feel that deeply. And um, they are a ranching society. The, 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 the ranching and mining interests are, are the big interests here. The, the mining industries worked in the dark, but didn't really come at it much. Because for one thing, the real, it's not so great for oil and gas. Um, and the uran price of uranium is down so much that, that they didn't really come after it, but they did come after it. And the Utah delegation came after it on their behalf. I mean, they didn't, the, the Utah delegation did what they said. But, but the, uh, the, 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 the most emotional is, is ranching. And uh, people would say, the reason this area is so splendid is because we have been the stewards of the land. We don't need this. We don't need out-of-towners. There's several things about it. All this is going to do is bring out-of-towners in. I'll say another thing, um, and I think it was three witnesses. At that trial, the, the, the people who I, in a sense, kind of admired the most, in a sense, but, but couldn't, as you can tell, get, get out of my mind, were real, lifelong conservationists who testified, I've always testified in favor of protection. But here, I just feel it's bringing in too many people. And, uh, and so that was there. That, that wasn't, there had never been a large number of people, but I think it's halfway profound. And, and uh, so, so there was that. But it, it really, I think, was, I mean, I, uh, uh, I, I decided along the way here, about the time I realized that there, there was no procedure for the Mon Monument Act, I, I, I realized that if, if you polled the people of San Juan County, that is the white Mormon population, the people, uh, and asked who owns all that open land out there, that you would get three answers, all about equal, about 33%. One would be the state owns it, the second would be the county owns it, and the third would be the ranchers own it, that public land. So, so that's the mindset, and, and um, I am one who's presenting it to you grudgingly, but, but with some feeling of, about it, and, and, and what's really troubling in a way, or I don't know troubling is just a fact, is that we were quick to uh, make um, uh, accommodations and saying grazing shall continue at the same rate. And some others that, uh, uh, you know, people just kept saying this is the end of a way of life and, and, and it, it uh, really wouldn't work that way. Also, uh, you know, speaking of the recreation industry, a related thing was that uh, the uh, 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 climbers were very influential. And we ended up having a uh, uh, long evening session uh, with the climbing community of Moab. And boy, was I moved. And, and because, and I was, I was worried about it. And I, I got to know the fellow who's the head of the access fund quite well. And, um, and he said that he, he couldn't speak for, the, for them. He, he would be favorable, strongly favorable. But um, we, we, we talked, and <clears throat> to a person, we just heard the most, the strongest statements on behalf of climbers. And they, they uh, wrote, ranged from, well, I can't think of anybody better to manage these lands and keep them safe than Indian tribes. Several put it kind of that way. But several put it, and, and, and very disarmingly and, and uh, modestly, said, look, I, I, I can't pretend that I know how you think, but I think that if you became a climber and were hugging those rocks 
you would be having a lot of the same feelings we have. And it was really moving. And so we ended up uh, sort of, you know, 10 o'clock at night, probably 40, 50 people. And, and what do we do next? And somebody said an MOA. But we did an, I thought it was kind of an interesting thing. We decided that we would write a letter to Secretary Jewell supporting them and wouldn't run it by the miners, uh, the, the climbing community, would send them a copy, and that they would write one supporting us. And uh, so that, that's how that, that was completed. I think that's me. And this sort of follows up on some of the comments you've made. Um, my question is, under existing law, is there anything that gives people who happen to be living close to land, public land that is to be designated a monument that gives them any more rights or any more say in, in whether that should happen rather than citizens at large? And, and I thought the answer is no, but I don't know. And, I, and is the bishop, because that, that was one thing the bishop bill would change is what I understand. That, um, and I guess it just seems to me very undemocratic that just because you happen to live next door you somehow have more rights to say what happens to public land than somebody who doesn't live next door. Um, I remember long ago when I started in this field reading a, a very academic book that um, listed the publics in public land law. And, uh, and, and they listed them in order of importance. And I don't remember where local citizenry came in, but it came in pretty high. Now, this was just a way to, you know, it was academic. It was a way to think about public land law. And, um, and I think that that reflects the politics, that local people do have more of a say. And I, I personally don't quarrel with that. They don't have a veto, but, but, but they, they, this, they should be heard, and their views should be given, a, it seems to me, somewhat heavier weight than other citizens. But other citizens mean other people in other states and globally, because the public lands are a global resource. So, so and, and Bishop's Bill would change that uh, for, for the Antiquity Act. Uh, Charles, <clears throat> as um, concerned individuals that might not be involved in the front lines of litigation, what are the most effective actions that we can take to help protect bears ears in the future, given the somewhat volatile situation we're looking at now? Well, of course, before I, I could have, you know, said to uh, contact the Interior Department, send stuff there, and to members of Congress. Um, um, but now, I mean, it's, it's, uh, th th those are not the decision makers anymore. The courts are. And uh, I feel kind of at peace about it, actually. I mean, um, we're going to go in and brief the hell out of it and see what happens. We're going to do our best. <laughs> uh, um, well, I told you about John Echohawk, didn't I? <laughs> Native American Rights Fund. Um, but um, I don't know. Uh, uh, I actually was thinking more in terms of go down there, visit it, enjoy it, and bring back what other, whatever ethical feelings you have and pass them on to your friends. I mean, somehow I, I almost feel that would be uh, fine. I don't mean to buy, be naive about it. The Grand Canyon Trust has been wonderful in this. Um, I'm on the board. and. While I didn't charge a fee, the Grand Canyon Trust paid all my travel expenses, just like that. And, and, and also sent a bunch of staff. They probably sent four staff members. Um, Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, the Wilderness Society, um, uh, the National Parks Conservation Foundation. Uh, uh, th those would be the main groups, I think. Oh, the uh, 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 Land Conservation Foundation. Yeah. 
Charles, I have a yeah. question. So, so you build the, um, you know, the local or tribal coalition in, in favor of this defined boundaries, and you're facing this processless process uh, with an objective. How do you, how do you approach? How, how did your how did you develop an initial strategy for approaching Washington, and then how did that evolve? You know, mm -hmm. over time, as you, I assume, found some successes, found some dead ends, and kind of worked your way through Washington. Well, as one of my best students, <laughs> you make me think. Um, and I'll be honest with you, um, I've never said anything like this in public before, but, but for whatever reason, particularly starting with the Native American Rights Fund, I was assigned to cases that didn't have any precedent. And so I just, as a human being, had to sit down and try to figure out how to proceed. And now here, I mean, th there, are, uh, there aren't procedures, but there are channels. And there are procedures. There, there are customs that are used. And so you try to figure them out. But, um, but I'll say to young people, and, and uh, you, you'll be in fields of law that, that we probably can't even imagine today. And uh, somehow I'd say, go into it. <laughs> and, and, and open your mind and create what you can create. And, and, and um, so, I mean, I, I guess that's the best I can put it. It really was that I was assigned them. I never was assigned them because I so we got to give it to Wilkins and get some everyone number. It wasn't like that. It was just I, I ended up with them, and uh, yeah. Professor Wilkinson, um, <laughs> another so, one of my best students. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was wondering uh, if you are more optimistic or made nervous by the fact that Zinke's recommendations to Trump have been so secretive and that there's been such a delay between when we thought they were going to be released and apparently when they are going to be released? Does that affect your feelings at all? Um, boy, it's strange. I'm not at all nervous about this. We're just going to write briefs and do oral arguments and see what happens. Um, but I will say this, that um, just as uh, these words, that that's all presidents can do, is, is what's up there in Section A, um, there's another broad thing that I think can matter here. And that is that the Obama administration, we will show, so clearly went about this the right way. They looked at everything. They heard everybody out. It took them uh, two years, basically, uh, because before our petition came in, they had started, or proposal came in, they started to think about it. And so the record is like this. Well, these folks, um, uh, the most recent, quote, report by Secretary Zinke is 19 pages long. I think Bears Ears is one and a half pages of it. It's utterly embarrassing. Um, and he went out, I mean, he loves to go horseback riding. And so there are all these pictures of him riding in front of Bears Ears. And so that, he never got on the ground, uh, I think. Now, one thing, I, I could be surprised, it may be they've made a record. And, and probably have, but I, it can't be anything like theirs. And what, what's worse for them, and this is part of your question, is that from the beginning, they were saying, we're going to make changes. This has got to be addressed. And so um, um, whereas with the Obama administration, it was up in the air till. December 28th, or maybe December 15th. So, uh, so they had open minds, and they really did. It wasn't, that's just not saying it. So that you, you have two different types of decision making. And, and we, we are so used to 
assessing judges by the quality of the record and, and th that they have. And this doesn't exactly fit that, but, but I think that's going to be an important intangible, or maybe, maybe it's tangible. So, so the, the fact that th those things don't make me nervous, they make me hopeful because they, they have not handled it well. Yeah, I want to say that um, um, our family, th this was one of our favorite places, you know, before any of this was happening. And um, what drew me into that actually was I was writing a book in the Colorado Plateau. And like any good lawyer and professor, I decided I had to do a lot of research. And you can't research without a backpack and six or eight water bottles. <laughs> and uh, so, so I heard about, I'll even tell you what canyon it is uh, that's in the book, uh, uh, Slickhorn Canyon. And uh, that was just me and Phil. Later, my other boys came and came uh, on, on different trips. But uh, we went up and found a perfect kiva. Roof still on and uh, ladder still operating. And uh, I checked out with a friend, who, a Hopi friend, who said, I asked him, is it OK if we, because I, I knew there was a perfect key in there. I wasn't sure exactly where. But, but he, uh, he said, no, just as long as you're respectful. And so uh, uh, Philip and I did go in. We went down. and. Uh, now, uh, uh, I suppose 25 years later, um, I, I still remember every second of, of being in there with Philip. We never said a word to each other. Haven't talked about it since. I don't know why. I think we both just say, well, that happened. And we had our thoughts. And we don't need to share them even with each other. I think that's what we both think. And. Uh, so, so I did. I, I, I suppose I was drawn there by a book. And uh, uh, maybe it will help to say one other thing that I was told, quote, go to Slickhorn Canyon by Terry Tempest Williams. <laughs> so that, that's pretty authentic stuff. Probably have time for one more. Anybody else? <laughs> um, I have a question. Thanks. I echo the thanks for, for presenting today. This has been really interesting. Um, I'm curious, assuming that Trump does take some action to drastically reduce the size of bear's ears. Um, this is not a hypothetical question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when he does. Um, and litigation to challenge that decision to reduce that sign begins and is ongoing, what will happen to Bears Ears? Would you need to get an injunction to preserve it in its current size? Do you feel confident about your odds of doing that? <clears throat> well, first, I, I can't help but say uh, that when it begins will either be Tuesday or Wednesday, I think. That's when the litigation will begin. Because we are ready to go, and, and about four other lawsuits with conservation and uh, recreation industry people will be right behind us. Um, um, but, but I'm sorry, I, t tell me what the rest of the question was. I'm sorry. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah. And we so far have decided that it's too early. 
And we, we want to go for a preliminary injunction. We think we've got the better case. We want to go for the preliminary injunction. But we don't want to go for the wrong preliminary injunction. So because if you lose on the preliminary injunction, it, it, it's a, you know, it infects the whole case. So, so, so we're at the moment inclined not, not to do that. I was on the phone this morning with a long conference call with the Bears Ears Commission uh, of tribes that is, is going to be doing the collaborative management. And park service people were there. Very inspiring to me. Uh, the, the park service and, and BLM field people, the professionals, um, unlike the political people back in Washington, have really been good. We're very optimistic about dealing with them now. We, we, we've met several times, about five times, and it's not enough to know that it's going to be good, but we, we really think that it's, it's very promising. Uh, so, but, but, but I think probably, well, we've decided not yet to go ahead with, with, with preliminary relief. It's a great question, but uh, that, that, that would be. Well, thank you so much and enjoy a, a great weekend. <laughs>